Thank you, Alan. All right. It's incredible to be here, and I am in Renicky LLC with Dr. G. Christian and uh, Rob Spiller and my beautiful wife, Christine, and myself. And we're very uh, aligned to Alan and Muskin and the nurse and children and in our commitment to end starvation on this planet. So thank you for having us here. Yeah. And, uh, so I'll give you a short version of the PowerPoint, and then tomorrow we'll do tonight. Even. I'll be doing one. Yeah. Okay, it's basically just so you understand what we really have in New Skin and in the level of science that New Skin does. So this is a little schematic of DNA. And DNA was thought really until recently to be everything in terms of who you are and your characteristics and to some extent that's true but it's not the whole story. DNA is actually the blueprint of life. Okay? It's, the, it's the alphabet that carries the information. That's really what DNA is. It's letters of DNA carry the information, okay? Similar, here's just a picture I put there just so you can get kind of a concept. If you had a blueprint of the human brain, that's what DNA is. It's the information that is, that is carried. So there's many, many, many kinds of cells in the human body. There's nerve cells and different kinds of white blood cells and platelets, this is a red blood cell. They all have the same DNA but they don't all do the same things. They don't all look the same. And the reason is not every gene is expressed in every cell. Some, some cells have certain genes turned off. Liver cells have certain genes turned on, but they all have the basic same genetic code, okay? It's called gene expression. Genes are expressed in some cells, not in other cells. There's something we call epigenetics. And epi means above. And you could call that the grammar of life. The DNA is the basic blueprint, but epigenetics is the grammar, how that plays out. And one example would be with a, if you're reading a book, okay, the DNA would be all the words and the you know the actual hard copy of the book. And everybody that reads it be the epigenetics. If 20 people read the same book, there's 20 different interpretations, even though the words on the page are the same. It's the perception of the person reading and their experiences. So DNA is, is the nuts and bolts of, of your proteins. But how it's expressed is called epigenetics. And here I'll give you a couple examples. So in World War II, there was something called the Dutch Hunger Winter, which we lost a lot of people. 30,000 people died from famine. Scientifically, what was learned from that was that prenatal exposure to famine showed a direct correlation. Birth weight, diabetes, obesity, coronary heart disease, other cancers. But what was even more interesting was that low birth weight in the grandchildren also occurred. So another generation later. And that suggested that how the grandmother eats when carrying the mother affects two generations later the epigenetics. And that's not necessarily obviously intuitive in terms of most of what you've heard in terms of Darwin's theory of evolution, okay? And that's a very important point, and I'll, I'll go into it more. So there was an article in Time in 2010 called Why Your DNA Is Your New Destiny, you've seen that. One of the biggest takeaways was, so they looked at children in this village, okay? And there were different periods of feast or famine in that village. But what was actually amazing was how the child ate. So this is not a um, person even ready to have children. We're talking about as a child, 
how that child ate, whether they fasted or overate, would affect two generations later. So a biological chain of events started where if the child overate, his grandchildren would die one to two decades earlier. And that's an amazing concept right there because that's even pre-birthing years for that child. And on the converse, if that child went through famine, so more of a more restriction type situation, two generations later, their grandchildren could live up to one or two decades longer. And this is the scientist that did this work, and it's his son and his grandchildren, his grandchild. Literally, how he ate as a boy affects him his grandchild. It's through epigenetic marks, they're called. Environmental factors, diet, stress, prenatal nutrition, making imprints on the genes that are generations later still holding as an effect. So there's about 120,000 proteins in the human body. And what proteins are, are they're the structure of the cell. Okay, so if I this room was a cell, this would be protein, this would be protein, everything, all the mechanical devices are made out of protein, enzymes are proteins, okay? All the structured functions in a cell, the nuts and bolts are proteins. So, when the, you've heard about the Human Genome Project, obviously a lot, and 2003 was completed, all the genes of the human DNA were sequenced and known. So the thought was there was about 120,000 proteins. There's going to be about 120,000 genes, okay? And we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans, so we have 46 chromosomes. What actually was found was 25,000 genes, which is a big number, but it isn't 120,000. So there was a discrepancy there. And the paradigm had to start shifting in terms of what's going on. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the genes in your body and the proteins you make. And it's, it's called gene expression. How those 25,000 genes are used to make 120,000 proteins is called gene expression. And that's more the epigenetics, how that blueprint is used to build protein. I have a little, very simple example here. So this the DNA is actually a double helix, but it's a helix looking molecule like this. This is would be like a protein. So the DNA actually is, has a sleeve of protein around it. So this gene cannot be expressed unless it's allowed to be accessed. This protein has to be removed to a certain extent. So when you see little pictures of chromosomes, those are only about half DNA and the other half is protein, which is helping condense it, but it's also covering the genes in a certain way that not every gene is accessible at all times. And that's based on what the environment's saying. That whether this gene is allowed to be accessed is part of epigenetics. Okay. The expression is determined by the cell's perception of its environment. Uh, in 1990, there's a, a famous biologist, Nihau, he wrote a paper called Metaphors and the Role of Genes and Development. And this is an amazing statement that most people wouldn't have thought of even not that long ago in science. When a gene product is needed, a signal from its environment, not an emergent property of the gene itself, activates expression of the gene. You see, the genes themselves don't tell themselves who's on and who's off. It's the environmental influence. And what I'm leading into is why what Newskin is doing is, first of all, even possible. And second of all, why it's so unique. Okay? 